Pelosi wrapping up a historic visit in Taiwan, but the rebuttal out of Beijing is just getting started. And watch this story. Uh, good morning, everybody. I'm Bill Hemmer. Dana's got the day off today. Martha, good morning to you. Hello. Hey there, Bill. Good morning. Great to be with you. I'm Martha McCallum. This is America's Newsroom, and Speaker Pelosi departed Taiwan for South Korea. She leaves after a meeting, a very high-profile meeting with the Taiwanese leaders, and clearly in full defiance of a very angry China. So Speaker Pelosi pledging America's unwavering support for democracy in Taiwan, something that Beijing does not view as acceptable, but the CCP is not taking that lying down, Martha. China putting out a new saber rattling video this morning showing their missiles at the ready and fighter jets moving into position as Beijing prepares to hold its largest Taiwan military drills. They'll go on for six days. We haven't seen them at this magnitude in 30 years. They are set to surround the island while conducting live fire exercises. Some of those drills will happen in Taiwanese waters. Former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo arguing that it's America's responsibility to hold Beijing accountable. And over these last 48 hours with respect to Pelosi's trip is just a, a symptom of the challenge that's in front of us. We weren't going to sit back and just listen to their rhetoric and do nothing. We could have said, if you continue down this path or you conduct live fire exercise, uh, we're going to begin to take real action. Uh, there was no threat to China itself. Uh, they created this crisis. We should not let them... We should let them use the visit of Speaker Pelosi to, to create this big uproar where America says, oh, my goodness, we're going to have World War III. They want to be a superpower. They need to begin by like a more normal nation. New reaction coming from NSC spokesman John Kirby, who will join us. But we begin with senior foreign affairs correspondent Greg Palcott following all of this for us in London. Good morning, Greg. Hi, Martha, Bill. Nancy Pelosi might be gone, but Taiwan's troubles might just be beginning. House Speaker ended her brief controversial visit to Taiwan a short while ago, during which she met with the island's president and other officials, saying the U.S. always wants Taiwan to have, quote, freedom with security and will not back away from that. All of this, as we've been reporting, upsetting China, which sees the island as its own. It claims to have conducted, even while Ms. Pelosi was there, military drills in the area. But the big stuff set to start to continuing for four days in six zones around Taiwan, basically encircling the island. Beijing says its armed forces will participate in live fire exercises. In some places, this action will come as close as 10 miles to the Taiwan coast. In many places, it could violate Taiwan's nautical and airspace. Taiwan says it will interfere with its shipping and flights and certainly up the possibility of a potentially dangerous run-in. The last time, yes, things got so hot in the region with China was 1995. In that case, U.S. naval assets were quickly deployed there now in part due to the Pelosi visit. They're already there, including, as we've been telling you, the huge USS Ronald Reagan aircraft carrier strike group. Washington continues to warn Beijing not to turn this into a crisis. Martha, Speaker Pelosi should be arriving just about now in Seoul. She will then go on to Tokyo, which both of which should be safer bets, but both of which still perilously close to and threatened by Beijing. Back to you. Yeah. It's just stunning to look at that graphic, to see Taiwan surrounded in the way that it is right now. And you have to wonder if and when they will pull out of those areas. Uh, we'll be watching, Greg. Thank you very much. Greg Palcott in London. The Deep Triple C dropping a half million dollar ad buy to prop up my primary challenger with seven days to go uh, is not something that we would like to see. And I know a lot of even my Democratic colleagues in Washington have been outraged at just the cynicism and hypocrisy that that represented. Peter Meyer, he won his election two years ago, but now he has lost in his primary battle. He is one of 10 Republicans in the House who voted to impeach Donald Trump. And the president, former president, endorsed John Gibbs. And Gibbs has been a winner in that congressional district there in the state of Michigan from last night. Also from last night in Michigan, the governor's race, Shooter Dixon, picked up a late endorsement by President Trump. That happened on Friday of last week. She was an easy winner, it turns out. So the Republicans now have their candidate to go up against Gretchen Whitmer in November. Move a little further west here in the state of Missouri. This has been something that, well, let's look at the Senate right now on the Eric versus Eric battle. Remember that? 
Eric Greitens about a month ago, he, he looked like the front runner. He finishes in a distant third as Eric Schmidt, the attorney general, uh, is an easy winner of the congresswoman Hartzler there uh, in the state of Missouri. So now Republicans have their matchup in the Missouri as well to fill that slot of Roy Blunt. They want to try and keep it red come November. Tell you where the drama is happening right now out in Arizona. First of all, Blake Masters, endorsed by President Trump, was an easy winner here. You got about 82% of the vote counted so far in Arizona. Uh, this is Maricopa County, where Phoenix is. You have about 60% of Republican voters in Arizona vote in Maricopa County. You see that 39% figure? Just one of these little data points that we watch. He matched that number in that county alone to Maricopa, where you find Phoenix. It's something we watch here throughout the, uh, uh, the voting here. On the governor's race, this is really where the drama is because this is too close to call. Right now, you've got Carrie Lake endorsed by President Trump, leading Karen Taylor Robson, endorsed by Vice President Mike Pence by about two points. All right, and in Maricopa County right now in Phoenix, you see Taylor Robson uh, beating Lake by about a point. It may or may not be enough right now to overcome the margin that we're seeing on behalf of Kerry Lake. So we'll see how that plays out. 80% of the vote counted. Kellyanne Conway joins me now. And Kellyanne, good morning to you. Size it up. What did last night tell you today? We learned so much heading into the fall last night, Bill, not least of which is, you know, the Republican nominee for governor in Kansas and the Republican nominee for Senate Missouri are both the sitting attorneys general. This is important because crime and safety will continue to be big issues to voters right, left and center. They see the rise in crime in their cities. They see the fentanyl pouring over the border and they want somebody as a chief executive or representing them in Washington who's going to, of course, meet the challenge. Um, the other thing that's going on is in, Min in Michigan and in Kansas, and of course in Arizona, regardless of which woman emerges as the nominee there, we see this continuing trend bill of candidates of color and female candidates running and winning as Republicans. In Michigan, you have John Gibbs, my former colleague in the administration. He, sat, he served in the opioids cabinet that I ran, a great member of our administration, African-American man, beating Pete Meyer, that freshman. You have over in Michigan 10, John James, African-American man, woman. You have Amanda Atkins in Kansas 3 as our nominee now. And you'll have a female uh, Republican nominee as governor. Why is this important? Well, it's important for a few things, a few reasons. In 2020, even though Joe Biden became the president, you had no Republican incumbent losing his or her seat. And of the 15 blue to red changes in the House bill, 11 were taken by women and all 15 were taken by a candidate of color, a female, a veteran, or some combination thereof. So that continues. Last point. We also see this continuing trend starting from 2016, where Hillary Clinton won the Hispanic vote by 38 points. In 2020, Joe Biden won by 21 points. It's a 17 point decrease. Now, the Democrats, if you look at all the polling in these primaries so far, they only lead by about 12 or 13 percent. And it's not just that Republicans continue to win Hispanic voters. It's that we are winning with Hispanic candidates like Maya Flores last month in the Rio Grande rally. But that is a huge trend going in. A last point about Pete Meyer. He's whining a little bit about the corrosiveness of Washington. He's a freshman member. Yes, he was one of the 10 who voted to impeach President Trump, but he also voted for the infrastructure bill. He also voted for the gun control bill. He also voted to approve of the January 6th committee formation. So here is someone who kept sticking his finger in the eye of many of his constituents who put him there. And he won a Republican primary yeah. and then won the seat as a conservative Republican, as an America first Republican, and then didn't vote that way. Oh, three of the 10 are still alive of those House Republicans who voted to impeach. Uh, in Kansas, referendum on abortion. Here's what we found, Kellyanne. Surprised a lot of people. Kansas voters overwhelmingly vote to protect abortion rights in their constitution. 60% say no. What, what does that tell you coming on the heels of Roe v. Wade and the U.S. Supreme Court and maybe what it pretends for other states who might be doing something similar? Two things, Bill. First, this is exactly what the Dobbs decision designed the next steps to be, which is kick it back to the states, let the people decide. In Kansas, they spoke very loudly last night um, based on the language of that particular initiative that was before them. Um, secondly, it may be too soon. Emotions are raw. Confusion is deep. Uh, you see that uh, Planned Parenthood, I, I, I read last week, had a 40 
a 40-fold increase in donations right after the Dobbs decision. So people are concerned that we've gone from all abortion, anyone, anytime, anywhere, essentially under road to nothing in some of these states. So it may be a little too soon for that. I would point out to you, you know, everybody, uh, including on other networks, of course, lower rated networks, are lo love to say today, oh, Kansas is a conservative state, it's a red state. Look, that's true and it's not so true. Um, I don't really like when we talk about states that way, but in this case, they have a female pro-choice Democratic governor. She's up for re-election this year. She won last time, Laura Kelly, with less than 50 percent of the vote, mm -hmm. but she is the governor there. And I, I, I think when we just look at one state as red or blue, pro-life or pro-choice, we're not really respecting the diversity of opinion, let alone the population okay. in these different states. But it may be just a little too soon for some voters to be going to the ballot box and saying no to abortion. Well, some snap analysis as of this morning. Thank you, Kellyanne. Good to have you on today. We'll see how this all plays out very Thank soon. You, nice to see you, Kellyanne Conway. Martha, what's next? Very interesting take there. All right, so the disturbing reality of the border crisis on full display as a migrant drowns while trying to cross the Rio Grande River illegally. The tragedy is a near daily occurrence where people are not necessarily being dealt with compassion, losing their lives uh, on that river in a, on a daily basis, Bill. Mm. Also, the problems keep racking up for Paul Pelosi, allegedly slurring speech and had a drug in his system during that DUI bust. Uh, what that is, we don't know yet, but how he tried to play the privilege card to get out of it. We will see him in court today, Martha. Mm -hmm. That'll be interesting. Also, landlords demanding an end to the COVID era eviction bans, arguing their properties are being stolen from them by Democrat policy. Court documents revealing some stunning new details into the drunk driving arrest of House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband. Paul Pelosi was allegedly slurring his speech, reeked of alcohol, and had some kind of drug in his system, according to these newly released documents. They show that two separate vehicles sustained major collision damage. That's a quote from the report. Paul Pelosi's Porsche and the other driver's Jeep. When officers asked for his driver's license, Pelosi also slid them his 1199 foundation card. That's a California Highway Patrol charity that supports officers and provides scholarships for their children. The other driver, who is uh, simply being referred to as Mr. Doe in these filings, reported, the, I think the following day, that he had pain to his right arm, his right shoulder, and his neck, yes, the day after that collision. So Pelosi crashed into Doe on the way to his Napa Valley country house on May 28th. He's set to appear in court this morning. We'll be watching that. He will be arraigned on DUI charges. Meanwhile, another tragedy at the southern border. Our Fox News team witnessing a migrant drown in those treacherous waters crossing the Rio Grande. Uh, this while trying to illegally come into the U.S. Griff Jenkins back on that story. Hidalgo, Texas. Uh, Griff, what more have we learned about that? Good morning there. Well, good morning, Bill. And there had been 185 migrant deaths here in the RGV sector as of this past Sunday. Now we add one more to this unprecedented account. Take a look at this video we shot yesterday as we watched the Coast Guard and the Texas game warden pulling a lifeless body from the group of migrants have been crossing. They got into those tough waters. They turned back one man, obviously not making it. Texas DPS Lieutenant Chris Oliveras saying it just shows the total disregard that these cartels have for human life. Listen here. Well, they don't care. They treat these immigrants as a commodity. Um, their main purpose is to get these immigrants across the river into the United States because they're profiting all, off these migrants right now. And because of that, it's a multi-billion dollar trade. Meanwhile, this triple digit heat not slowing the flow of migrants. Fox News learning exclusively this morning in the last 24 hours, there were 1,093 encounters here in the RGV sector, more than 1,400 over in the Del Rio sector where our drone flies high. Now that includes these large groups you're seeing over there. If you add these two sectors together, RGV and Del Rio, it is more than 800,000 encounters Bill, This is most of the migrants being bused to DC and New York are coming from these two sectors. 
with another bus. If you look at this video, another bus of migrants arriving in D.C., where the mayor is very upset about it. And New York City's mayor, Eric Adams, saying no thanks to Governor Abbott's invitation to come here and see what we're seeing. Writing Adams' office, writing this. Instead of a photo op at the border, we have Governor Abbott will focus his energy and resources on providing support and resources to asylum seekers in Texas as we have been hard at work in New York City. Well, it's important to point out, Bill, that not all are seeking asylum. Last week here in the RGV, 22 gang members arrested along with four criminal migrants. Bill? The numbers are just staggering yet again. Griff, thank you. Griff Jenkins down in Eagle Pass, Texas. Martha has more now. Yeah, just incredible images from the border. Uh, we're going to bring in business to Fox Business anchor Maria Bartiromo. She's in Edinburgh, Texas this morning, where she'll be sitting down with Governor Abbott and other Texas lawmakers for a live Fox Nation special on the border crisis. Maria, good morning to you. Uh, interesting to note in that report that Eric Adams does not want a photo op with Governor Abbott. Uh, and he's very upset, as is uh, Mayor Bowser in D.C., about migrants being bused to places like New York City and Washington, D.C. Yeah, Martha, it's absolutely extraordinary. And, you know, the real rich hypocrisy of it all is that these mayors want federal funding and they want the National Guard. Uh, Texas doesn't have any federal funding. Texas is not uh, talking about uh, this need for uh, additional National Guard. The bottom line is Texas has taken on all of the protection itself. The Operation Lone Star has done an excellent job trying to secure what is a wide open border. Martha, we have seen some incredible pictures while I was down here. This is my fifth time at the border, and every time I come, I learn something more. Yesterday, I went to the crimes lab of the Department of Public Safety, and we saw many of the drugs that are seized, and they have this huge testing facility where they will seize the drugs, and then they test them to see whether there's fentanyl in it. There's so many drugs that are being laced with fentanyl and killing off Americans. You know 100,000 people have died of overdoses because of fentanyl. So we're talking about that today in this live streaming program on Fox Nation. It starts at 11 a.m. I'll talk with uh, Governor Abbott. I'm also going to speak with Maida Flores, uh, the congresswoman who just won this special election. She uh, turned over a seat that was held by, uh, by Democrats for 100 years and the reason that she was able to turn that seat is because the people on the border, the people of Texas and Arizona are feeling this the worst. They know that they can't even go out to their ranch to throw out the garbage without carrying their pistol. They know that their entire properties are getting trashed by these gotaways. I mean, you just showed the number of people who have been encountered. How about the people who are just getting away? That we know mm. some 900,000 people have gotten into the country where they're seen on surveillance video they don't have good intentions. If they had good intentions, then we would see them want to get encountered. Uh, not to mention the 50 people that have been on the terrorist watch list. So this is an enormous story. That's why we're covering it so much here at Fox News and Fox Business, because it's impacting every state, not just the border states. Yeah, it's such a great point, Maria. And, and I just want to go back to the point you made on the hypocrisy of Washington, D.C. and New York leadership endorsing essentially the federal policies on immigration except not in their backyard yeah. right and as you point out they want they That's want right. national guard support where they are and yet we've yeah. put this enormous burden on texas and arizona to deal with it on their own uh, based on a federal policy that is imposed on them Right. So rather than attacking Greg Abbott uh, and, and, and the officials in Arizona, pick up the phone and call President Biden to find out why this administration and the Democrats refuse to acknowledge what's taking place. Some people calling it an invasion. And let's not forget all of the drugs killing America and where they're mm. coming from, because the underlying yeah. chemicals in fentanyl are made in China. So first we've got this COVID-19 disaster killing America, uh, 1 million Americans. And now we've got fentanyl killing 100,000 Americans, all originating in China. I don't think fentanyl came up in the phone call that Joe Biden had with Xi Jinping. And I'm wondering why not? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. I, I remember President Trump pressing the Chinese president on exactly that That's issue, right. on why they were allowing fentanyl to come into the United States. And it should be something that all presidents can agree on is, is a huge security issue for our country. Maria, thank you very much. We'll look Absolutely. forward to that special on Fox Nation at 11 a.m. this morning. Thanks, Maria. Great to have you with us. Bill?
Thanks, Thank Martha. you, Martha. 25 right. past. Maria, see you soon. Nancy Pelosi has left Taiwan, vowing to preserve democracy in that country. How will China respond? Is the U.S. ready for... Biden's right-hand man has been killed in a U.S. airstrike. Some fear that the next leader of al-Qaeda could become even more brutal in order to attract a new generation of terrorists. Joining us now, Brett Velikovich, former U.S. Army Special Operations soldier. Brett, great to have you with us. Good morning to you. Thank, um, nice it, to see it's you. a very interesting point, nice to see you too, that you bring up here, because this raises a lot of questions about who fills the void of Zawahiri. And although Al Qaeda has been uh, nearly decimated, this could be an opportunity to inspire a younger new generation of potential terrorists, right? Well, exactly. And I think we really have to take a close look at the factors of why Zawahiri was actually in Kabul. Who invited him there? Who did he meet with? Because this is a larger issue than just one man in Al Qaeda. This makes it extremely clear to me that Al Qaeda is back in Afghanistan and they have a level of protection from the Taliban. It still hasn't even been a year since we left. The administration previously assured us that the American people you know, we're, we're clear that Al Qaeda was no longer a threat there and that these elements were not in country and that there was no danger to the homeland. But he was there visiting his family in a residential area of former Afghan government officials. He was staying in the home of a known Haqqani leader. He felt so comfortable coming back to Afghanistan for some reason. It tells you that the environment there is very permissive for terrorists now. And you likely have other senior leaders in Al Qaeda in the Haqqani network, individuals who for years have been hiding out in Pakistan, out of reach in many cases, and now they're back. And I can only imagine. How many other terrorists who have U.S. blood on their hands are, are simply coming back to Afghanistan? They're living there since the withdrawal of troops in the country. And so I really hope that, if anything, this strike hits pause on their thought that they can just operate without, you know, with, with impunity. I hope the strike sends a message um, to other leaders that even though we pulled out of Afghanistan, the U.S. isn't going to forget. They're paying close attention to these leaders. They're still being tracked down. And the U.S. government is not just going to forget about the hundreds of American soldiers who were killed at the hands of Al Qaeda and ISIS. Yeah, uh, you're so right. And th there's some interesting new reporting this morning on the the patterns that Zawahiri had, how he they detected that he kept going out onto that balcony morning after morning after morning. It gave them the opportunity to to isolate him and to take him out. But, you know, you touch on something that I think is really important, Brad, and, and it's the, the void that was created after we left Afghanistan. And I think back to 1990, to the, the assassination of Meir Kahani, or 1993, the first bombing in the World Trade Center. And then it was nearly 10 years later that we saw the 2001 attack on September 11th. So they have time and patience and, and will likely make this effort to rebuild. Can they build that kind of passion in this new generation of terrorists? Do they feel the same way as bin Laden and Zawahiri did about America? I think they can, absolutely. Um, they can build up. There was already talk about Saif al Adil taking, taking place for Zawahiri. He was the number three um, terrorist within Al Qaeda. So they're already talking about bringing this younger generation of, of terrorist leaders into play to help bolster um, um, this, uh, this new way ahead for Al Qaeda. And really, this strike, it was one of the most significant counterterrorism operations since um, the operation to take out ISIS leader Abu Bakr al Baghdadi. And Al Qaeda is trying to, to fill that, that void. But really, this strike, it's a testament to the precision, I think, at which the U.S. government is able to strike. And the level of precision here, I think, it would surprise a lot of people, to your point earlier. You know, I think a lot about the men and women behind this operation, the level of precision it takes to pull something off. This is months of painstaking intelligence work, months of watching, waiting, establishing patterns of movement. And I'm glad that, uh, in the end, this strike was successful. We have the best uh, people working for us, and it is a true victory for them and for the hours and days and nights that they pulled uh, to pull this off, and we give them enormous credit for that. Brett, thank you very much. Always good to see you. Brett Belikovich. Thank you. Thanks. Today, the world faces a choice between democracy and autocracy. America's determination to preserve democracy here in Taiwan and around the world remains ironclad.
So that happened overnight. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, a bit earlier in Taiwan, leaving that country, pledging America's support for Taipei in the face of escalating threats out of Beijing, including live fire military drills, which are set to begin this week. John Kirby, National Security Council spokesman, uh, with me from the White House. Nice to see you, sir, and thank you for your time uh, yet you bet, again Bill. here. How much concern is there at the White House with these live fire military drills on behalf of well, China? Well, we're certainly watching them uh, as closely as we can. You might recall on Monday, we said publicly that this is exactly what we would expect the Chinese to do uh, in the wake of or even during uh, Speaker Pelosi's uh, trip. So this is uh, pretty much uh, the playbook we expected. We'll be watching to see how they, uh, how they develop. Uh, again, we urge Beijing not to escalate the tensions. There's no reason to. Nothing about Speaker Pelosi's trip was inconsistent with uh, our longstanding approach to both uh, China and supporting Taiwan's self-defense. Okay. I, I believe, John, you used the words, we expect them, meeting China, to continue to react. Like how? Well, I think, uh, as we said uh, a couple of days ago, we would expect to see military exercises. Uh, we might expect to see some air activity uh, across the median line in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, we might expect them to want to take economic measures. They've already announced a, a few. Uh, so we're, uh, we're watching this closely. Again, uh, we expected that the Chinese would have some sort of uh, a show of force, even a muscular reaction, and they appear to be uh, doing that. Uh, but we urge them not to escalate tensions any uh -huh. further than they already are. There's you, no reason you've, for you've that. You've got the issue out there with Ukraine and Putin, the support they've expressed for that as well. Uh, John, um, just go back in the rearview mirror of the past couple of days. Some are arguing that this whole public spat with Speaker Pelosi made America look weak. Could we not have handled that better, including from the White House? Well, geez, Bill, I don't know that there was a public spat with Speaker Pelosi. I mean, we've been nothing but consistent here at the White House that we respect her decision to go. This is her decision uh, that we provided uh, her, uh, obviously, the support, context, analysis that she needed to make her decision. But uh, I don't I don't believe that there was a public spat but over you would, whether you she would should go. You would see that I'm, the, the White House tried to talk her out of it. That was pretty obvious. No. Actually, no, I wouldn't concede with that. I, I think we gave her context and information. Uh, we gave her uh, an analysis of uh, what it was going to look like, not just in this one stop, but the, all the stops that she's making on this important trip of first. She makes her own decision. I mean, my goodness, Bill, I've been saying that for, for days now. This is her decision to make. Uh, Congress is a co-equal, independent branch of government. And members of Congress, including a previous Speaker of the House, have traveled to Taiwan, including this year. So uh, uh -huh. very, very consistent. Very, very uh, okay, consistent. Okay, let, let me... Uh, squeeze in a few questions about Afghanistan. How long was Zawahiri in Kabul? We think that he was uh, in Kabul. Initially, the reporting is that he was there at least four months ago, which would have put it around April. Uh, you're saying that he may have been in Kabul as long as last year? Well, late last year. We think maybe as late as December. I don't mean a whole year ago. Probably, you know, over the last six, seven months. But we had to, that was an indication that we had. We had to verify that. And that was from a long, painstaking, meticulous effort in the intelligence community to verify and validate the information we thought we had. And that took months uh, to do, to make sure that well, the indications were accurate, that it really was him and he really was there, and then watch his pattern of life, see if we could really uh, make sure that uh, we had the right guy and that we had an opportunity through his pattern of life to maybe take this strike. It took a while, but, but really just several months. Yeah, last question here. Jen Griffin asked you on the 20th of August last year, remember this is in the, the chaos of Kabul and getting out of that country, uh, how many al-Qaeda fighters are in Afghanistan? Uh, and, and at the time you said, I, I haven't seen an estimate on that. Uh, we're a year later, John. What is the estimate on al-Qaeda fighters in Afghanistan? It's a fair question, Bill. I, I, I don't want to get too specific here, uh, but, uh, but we do not believe that the number is very, very large. Um, and uh, we're watching it uh, as closely as we can. To the previous uh, speaker you had on a little bit ago, I think he said something like uh, that we that we in the, the administration claim that uh, Al Qaeda wasn't there at all, and it was, it was, it was it, they were gone. And that is not true. Back to Jen's back to Jen's question to me, I was very honest about the fact that we knew Al Qaeda uh, was uh, had some presence in Afghanistan even before we left, but we just didn't have an exact you know 
fingertip feel on how many. We're starting to get a little bit more information now over the course of this last year. Obviously, we have more information. We were able to take out Mr. Zawahiri, uh, but uh, we would not assess that the, n the number is very, very large. John, please come back. Uh, I got a long list of questions, as you well know. We're out of time for today, but thank you for your time. John Kirby, Anytime, North Bill. Lawn, you bet. Yep, Thanks, you bet. Martha. So outraged over what schools are teaching their children in many cases, why one mom is threatening lawmakers with a series of lawsuits. I swear to you, I promise you, I will turn this into a class action lawsuit. Ambulance chasing.